everyone to another episode of HR and Payroll 2.0. I'm Pete Tiliakis, and as always, I'm joined by the legendary Julie Fernandez. Welcome, Julie. Thanks, Pete. Hey, and good morning. We usually record in the afternoons, and this time we're doing a morning recording, so it feels great to wake up and start the day thinking about a conversation. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It is. Maybe we should do these um, uh, first thing. It will give us more energy, <laughs> but we always have fun. We always have fun. So all good. Look, this week, I am incredibly thrilled to welcome a very special guest. Uh, he is the professor of law at Queens University and an adjunct faculty member at Cornell Law School. He is the director of Conflict Analytics Lab, which is a consortium for AI research on law and conflict resolution. And more importantly, he is the chief of policy at the Deal Lab for Global Employment, uh, a policy institute on global work. So welcome, Mr. Samuel Dehan, uh, to the show. Hi, Pete. Hi, Judy. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, thank you so much. We're, we're excited to have you. And I'm, I'm so excited to be talking about global employment, uh, EOR, and really just digging into what's going on over at Deal, because I think there's uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks that have questions and we want to we get those out. So um, really happy to have you here. Sam, one of the things I'd love to do is have you tell us a little bit about your your amazing career you um I, I and i want to ask you how in the world did you ever see yourself or end up in uh the hr world but tell us a little bit about your career and your work and what you do at the uh in your consortium leadership yeah that, that's a good question <laughs> yeah i didn't see myself i think i'm in the hr world but i'm discovering it and it's a, it's actually quite a exciting world yeah, so, so now I'm a law professor at uh, Queen's University in Canada and at Cornell Law School in the, in the United States. And I'm leading uh, the Deal Lab. Um, and, I'm the, um, and I created the Conflict Analytics Lab, which is a legal AI consortium. And but prior to that, I was a litigator. I was uh, first in private practice. And I uh, spent uh, quite a few years as a European Union officials um, mostly working as a cabinet member of the European Court of Justice. So I did a bit of employment law, uh, civil service, uh, labor law, uh, European Union, uh, social policies. So it's been, I mean, I've been quite connected to the HR world uh, indirectly, but uh, that's, um, yeah, that's so, so that's, uh, that's my connection to the labor uh, and HR space, yeah. Yeah, very good. So you've studied you've studied a lot of this, uh, I imagine, right? The construct of law and labor, uh, you know, around around each of those. But I, I, I'll tell you, I, I I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but I've certainly been around a, a number of case studies um, when it comes to uh, both my education and otherwise. And I always found them very fascinating. The outcomes can be different, right? And and it's uh, it, it is fascinating, just the um, the world of work itself in and of itself. So, uh, look, so Sam, tell us a little bit about. Um, Tell us a little bit about Deal. Uh, I know Deal very well, but I'd love for you to just sort of talk about what Deal does, who they are, and and, and where they fit into the HR ecosystem of, of today. Yeah, yeah, no, I I've I've known Deal for quite a few years because I've known the the founders uh, for quite a while, and we've been talking about this initiative. I mean, when it was just an initiative, not a not a unicorn. And and <laughs> from my perspective, uh, as as an employment lawyer. Um, it's we can talk obviously about the the financial aspects, the fact that it's an incredible success and so on. But for me, I'm, I'm I like to look at at labor compliance and 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 labor law issues. It's fascinating because they're so they are solving a very interesting problem in with global work. So and and this is a problem that has never been really addressed before. And I, and I see this in mostly at two levels. So yes, it's a full stack uh, HR management service, but I'd see it as more like divided in two levels. At the hiring level, prior to Deal and other ER companies, uh, you can read it was very complex to hire someone outside your legal system. Right? So if you could do, you could hire someone outside your legal system, but you only could hire them as a contractor. So now there's this. Uh, employer record option, which which resolves a big problem, which is the problem misclassification, right? So so that's 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 a very uh, uh, that's an enormous issue. That's probably as old as as the creation of of, of the notion of work, right? Yes. So then at the second level, which I find fascinating, also it solves an important problem during the work relationship, which is sometimes even more important than just the hiring aspect. So it, it is helping companies not only to hire. 
compliantly, it's maintaining uh, uh, a certain level of, of, of compliance. It, it's encouraging a company to abide with local labor laws. So, and that's, again, it's a very complex problem, especially for smaller companies that cannot uh, or that do not have yet a legal entity in another legal system. And, and, and a legal entity is only one. Uh, it's a tiny piece of the iceberg. Right. Uh, the other aspects, I mean, just m- m- taking care of, of pension rights, benefits, uh, even IP, tax, and, and I'm not even talking about termination. So these are very complex and many companies cannot really afford to have a, a full-time HR professional, let alone a global HR professional. So it is, in my opinion, solving a, a key, a, a, a many a, a employment law problems. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I love the fact that today's employer have uh, so many different ways of solving for their needs and creating opportunities for themselves. And I, I'm a huge, huge fan uh, of the EOR marketplace and the model itself. But tell me a little bit about how Deal Lab fits in with Deal's mission, right? So, so Deal's on a mission to help global employment be easier, it sounds like. Where does the lab come into that and what? how do they work together? So, so the lab was... Uh established uh, a year ago but it's been in the pipeline for for quite a while so so the, the lab has two missions the deal lab has one mission which is to advance uh, innovation in compliance tech and i can talk a little bit about the kind of uh, uh, ai technologies we're working on um and our second aim second mission is to advance knowledge in global work policy so, so it's been, uh, uh, and, and global work policies is extremely important right now because there's a lot of lacking regulation. There's a bit, there, there's quite a bit of gaps in the regulation. So, and, and I'm not talking about employment law only. I'm talking also about immigration policies, mm-hmm. uh, intellectual properties, equity compensation. So, so many of these issues, especially if you're using an, an EOR, not that they are problematic, they just are not these there are no answers in the regulation so i think it's important for us as as active or leading industry uh, a stakeholder to take an active role and work with academia work with uh policy experts and 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 other industry partners to to reflect on these issues and and to produce uh, uh actionable knowledge on yeah, these, on these aspects. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I've been studying the global EOR marketplace since probably about 2016, 17. I started writing some articles on it and started sniffing around it. And I, I'm a huge fan, right? I, I came from the PEO world, the domestic US PEO world, where I saw the value of that 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 vehicle for organizations to do the right thing uh, and, 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 and lay a foundation of a very mature HR capabilities at a young at a young age in their in their organization, and I think that the EOR model is very similar, right? And to your point, um, what I love about it is it's both a human um, human opportunity enabler, but it's also an org agility enabler for companies to be able to quickly step into an environment in a new country where they may not have business nexus and not even have any real knowledge of the or, of the location right. um, and do it in a great uh, excuse me in a in a way that is um, proper right it, it, it yeah. sets up a mechanism for people to do things the right way and I know there's been a lot of um, a lot of folks that feel like oh well eventually you know entities are going to sniff this out and they're going to say well uh, we, you know and try to attack it and there have been some I think legislative changes, right in Mexico, I think in Germany, um, and others where they have tried to make some some concessions around how how it works. But I think ultimately, at the end of the day, it provides the proper path for people to employ uh, workers and do so in a way that generates the revenues that that these uh, entities much you know certainly want. I know they want to protect their people, but they also want that that tax revenue. Uh, and it keeps, I think, keeps organizations from going down the wrong path of, of engaging people. But to your point, there's not, in, in not every country actually has a law that specifically focuses on EOR, to, no, to my knowledge. Is that right? No, in fact, there are only yeah. uh, quite a few. I mean, the most advanced yeah. legal system for that is is the Netherlands, maybe a little bit Germany. France has some regulation, but also I think a lot of these issues are misunderstood. I think a lot of governments don't quite understand yet yes. the concept. I mean, I think sometimes there is a confusion um, because many, some of them or some 
uh, uh, stakeholders uh, might see the OR as some kind of a temp agency system, which is quite different. So, so it is not a, a, a resolve. It's still a, a, a complex question in the in the labor law uh, community. It's not even. It's, and, and in many, if you look in many academic papers, yeah. or policy papers, the issues. I know in HR, it's a pretty hot topic. It's been a hot topic for quite a while. But believe it or not, many of my colleagues don't even don't even think about these problems because they are not really uh, uh, um, they are not really in the agenda. Yeah, yeah, right. Until they, they don't know they have a problem, probably until they step out into that world. And I think a lot of folks, a lot of companies put just like payroll, right? They put uh, they put new market entrances from an HR perspective through the filter or the lens that their home country is. And that's not always going to translate in every uh, every location. And I think that's an, just another beauty of, of the EOR model is where it can guide you to that to that right answer. And and look, I'm a huge fan. Like I said, I, I think it's HRO's best kept secret. Um, I think more CHROs need to learn about it. But what does concern me is, and Julie, you and I have talked about this a lot, is just the low barriers to entry and the amount of new entrances to this market with very little differentiation. And a lot of times, possibly not a lot of capability behind what they're what they're bringing to market. So I worry that there's going to be this sort of stumble by a, by a provider that is going to make it uh, bad for everyone, right? Because they're going to give a bad reputation to the model for everyone else. And so I, I, I really hope that um, I want to see the community of, 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 of providers protecting this. Uh, and I yeah. love the consortium that's coming about, but, but look, so Sam, one of the things I wanted to, I wanted to talk to you about is, is just the fact that I think that, you know, I, I've described deal as a unicorn on a rocket ship, right? You guys have absolutely positively um, become the darling of the industry in a lot of ways, right? You've raced to the top of the charts. Uh, your valuation is what, like 12 plus billion now, I think 13 billion. That's right, um, yeah. yeah. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. I mean, it's just amazing. And you, and you, and your, your founders, I, I, you know, I've talked to Alex and, and, and I know that their vision for, uh, I believe they call it becoming the Apple of HR. I love that. I love that concept, right? That one-stop shop concept. Um, but there's, that's come with some criticism, right? And I know that's come with, um, you know, the market being critical of your success. Uh, there being some, some uh, informed and maybe even some misinformed commentary coming out. I, I've even been critical of deal being a little bit walled off and not, not allowing analysts to get closer, which you guys have completely opened up and, and, and started to do that with me, which I love. Um, but talk to me a little bit about um, that rocket ship rise. And and then I know there was a recent blog you guys put out to kind of set yeah. the record straight about what's going on at Deal. And I'd love for you to, to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about that, um, kind of wh- how we got here, where we are and what, you know, what that means and where you're headed. Yeah, yeah. So I can talk. I mean, first, uh, I can answer your first question is, in my opinion, and and I think that this rocket ship uh, can be uh, probably explained by the fact that, again, we're solving a labor law problem, but we're also helping many uh, smaller businesses to to use hiring tools that that, that was never available to them. I mean, we're talking about uh, uh, a small to medium-sized company. They can uh, now hire pretty much anyone anywhere, and and it really levels the playing field for for every organization, which is yeah. something that was not possible before. Only the large companies uh, uh, and had the ability to set up a, a full fledged legal entity, hire a legal team elsewhere. So so I think that, in my opinion, that explained this massive growth. Obviously, there are many other factors like COVID, the 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 fact that remote work has become um uh very much accepted i mean now there's a bit of a battle with a return to work uh, uh to the office policies but it's it's become much more the the new new normal and and i think at the same time also the fact that our founders um are very mission driven mm-hmm. and 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 they are very much you know aligned with the idea that we can find a way to help employers to remain compliant but also that's going to be helpful for the workers. And I think that goes back to your second question, which is that, okay, there's been some allegations recently. I'm not a litigator, so I'm not, I mean, I'm not a litigator anymore, so I'm not going to respond in detail uh, to each of these allegations. But for me, as, a, as, as also as with my academic hat and also as a, as a, as a, as a policy analyst, it, it's a bit odd because it's, uh, 
these allegations are very much at odds with our mission. And I mean, let's just let, let's just stick to one. The main one is that deal is encouraging encouraging uh, mm -hmm. uh, companies to violate employment laws intentionally. That, that's yeah. the second one. I mean, in law, yeah. so, I mean, first, I, I'm I'm always interested to look at at evidence, but here it seems like many of these allegations are. And unfounded. I haven't seen anything that seems convincing to me, and and but that's that's a separate discussion. But when you think about it, I mean, this whole idea is very much at odd with the rationale of the company, and also even from a business standpoint, it doesn't make a lot of sense. For us, I mean, we've got it, it's it's much more that that's the whole core essence of the business is to help companies to classify workers in the right legal category. So encouraging. Uh, employers to or client companies to hire only contractors makes very little sense from a business standpoint because i mean they we've worked really hard at least my my colleagues or my the the, the founders of the company work really hard to build this amazing uh, 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 panels or array of, of tools especially for full-time employees the em employer record uh, uh, immigration tools. Now we've got this misclassification tools. So, and that was way before this 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 debate. I mean, we've been working on this uh, algorithm, this machine learning system that can predict uh, with ninety five percent accuracy whether an, a worker is an employee or a contractor. And we've been been investing a lot of resources in that. And 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 we've been publishing all our data. The the tool and the algorithm is open source. So even it is very easy to to verify to assess the the quality of the prediction. So I, I'm just a little bit puzzled in general by the by these allegations because they don't really make sense from a from a from a business standpoint as well. Yeah, no, it, it is counter when you read it. It is a bit counter to what you're what you're fundamentally trying to build towards. So I, I, I would I would second that with you. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that you guys are leaning into this right and having this conversation because I've been one of the biggest. Uh, p pushers of of deal opening up and talking to to the to the market, and then I think that's great that you guys are doing that. So, re really really appreciate that. Um, so, look, Samuel, let, let's talk about let's go back to the lab a little yeah. bit, right? Let's talk about why why is this so important to the marketplace? I know why it's important, but I want I want you to explain it because I think for me, I think that the fact that what we've talked about, the fact that and let's even back up a step further, right? I mean, bigger than global expansion, right? Not every company is necessarily am has that ambition. But every company on the planet, to your point, the big companies have probably had the advantage here, but every company on the planet today really needs to be thinking well beyond their borders when it comes to hiring. If you want to have the best skills, uh, if you're going to be the most competitive and you're going to be able to activate your strategy, you're going to have to have people. And that means going and finding them, right? And, and just recruiting inside of your 50 mile radius is just no longer enough. So a total talent strategy really has to be uh, in play, I think, where there's a mix of uh, worker types and locations that you can go and pull those pull that pool from, and so I think you're going to see more and more firms, you know, dipping their toe into this world, and and they need that vehicle to help them do that. And I think that uh, the EOR, EOR model is exactly that. But as we have more and more and more firms going out to market, I think the the value and the and the and the key importance here is is that there aren't this established these aren't these established laws necessarily perfectly for this type of mechanism. And how do we make sure that we educate and, and provide the tools that give that marketplace the opportunity to have that? But is that it? Or is there is it a bigger part? Is there a bigger importance at the marketplace that you see it? Yeah, I think you, you're, 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 you're pointing out the, the real issue. I think the fact that the laws are not necessarily uh, suitable to the market needs. I mean, there's a mismatch yeah. between what the labor, where the labor market is going and, and, and the policies and and the regulations. So, yeah. and I'm talking really especially, for example, about the EOR and 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 how this is an issue that's not even discussed yet. So that's one problem. The second problem. So so that's where, but but that 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 that's um that's an interesting question. That's a policy question, right? But at the same time, for companies. We can complain as much as we want that there is, you know, there's a lack of policies. There is, there's, you know, there's a mismatch between them. But at the same time, we need to be compliant, right? You want to hire someone, you got to stick to the, you got to be compliant with the law. Okay. So our job as, as I would call deal an, an HR facilitator or an HR intermediator 
Our yeah. job is to help these companies to be compliant with all. And that's what the lab, where that's where the lab is stepping in. So we are building uh, HR compliance tools and hope very soon in, in, in 120 countries. So I can tell you a little bit about this, this uh, AI system that we've been building actually since 2020. So I started this uh, initiative back at the university and we've back in the day in 2015, that was a very sexy thing to use machine learning to uh, predict uh, uh, court decisions. So we mm-hmm. used uh, misclassification decision in Canada, okay, where I'm, yeah, where I'm based, and 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 we tried to use machine learning to predict uh, judges' decision when it came to uh, worker classification, and we found out that we were able to predict. Uh, judge's decision with 95% accuracy oh, explain wow. the algorithm was it was was capable of explaining the reason as to why it came up with that decision and also it 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 it, it extracts uh similar past cases so again like the idea is that it's ex- explainable it's legitimate unlike you know generative ai which pulls which which, which offers decisions that usually are uh, uh unfounded so, so, and now the idea is that we tr- we transfer this research to a deal lab, and now the idea is that we want to make this research and eventually this uh, uh, AI tool available to uh, uh, obviously all deals client, but we want to make it open access as well, and and help client companies to every time they hire an, a worker to guarantee that they're hiring this worker and they classify this worker in the right legal category. So very soon, uh, this AI algorithm is going to be available probably in the next few months in the fall, and 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 eventually we'll probably going to uh, uh, de- deploy uh, this tool in in other legal systems as 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 we make progress. Wow, I love it. So it, it sounds like fundamentally you're you're basically using artificial intelligence to look at case law and say, well, maybe in the absence of a law here or a specific piece of law around this. We, we know with confidence what judges will or won't do based on these outcomes, right? Yeah. And that can shape your guidance. Is that what you're saying? That's right, yes. So yeah. it's quite important for us you know, to, to understand the law first, right? We want to do policy. We want to influence uh, where policy is going. But yeah. first, you got to be compliant, right? We yes, can, yes. As I said before, we can just talk about, oh, this law is not great and so on. But, you know, but you're hiring someone, you've got to uh, give them... Uh, war termination compensation, you know, uh, uh, as you do, that that's compliant with with what what the law uh, yeah. stipulates. So so there's no way around that. But uh, th- that research, interestingly, is going to help us to steer the the the, the poly- policy reforms in the right direction. So let me give you an example that I, we currently uh, we've identified. So so in the context of worker classification. We see now that the, it's it's becoming harder for the algorithm to predict outcome in a binary fashion. Mm. More and more, we've got you know cases where, for a similar set of facts, five judges would say this person is a contractor, and three judges in other you know jurisdiction in other provinces or in other states in the U.S., for example, say mm, actually this person is a contra- is an is an employee. So what this suggests, and from a policy perspective, but that's a data-driven argument, what this suggests is that judges are really struggling. And there is a change in the labor market that suggests that it's becoming harder. This binary classification doesn't make a lot of sense. So maybe we should think about a third category, like it exists in Canada, it exists in Spain, and in other places, which is called a dependent contractor, uh-huh. which is a little bit in between. So, so I think it's very important to see these compliance technology, not only as a tool for compliance, which is very important, but also as a vehicle for policy change, because we'll see from the data that things are changing in the labor market and the law doesn't make a lot of sense. So maybe we have to reflect on new law reforms. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it. I, and I think it's doing that kind of heavy lift of sorting through this stuff, right? I mean, I love, uh, I love the, uh, the role of AI in our world that it's getting to that getting down to that result and saying, look, these are the results that you're going to likely get in this, in this, in this set of circumstances. So do you see using this output? Obviously you want to use it, I'm sure to shape your product. I'm sure it's going to help, uh, help the market, but what about like, what about lobbying? Do you see an opportunity to take this and lobby with governments to say, Hey, this is a vehicle to make this safe for your people to be employed. Um, I I don't know, but yeah, I think probably, 
lobbying may not be the 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 may not be the right uh the best approach but yeah. i'd say you know en engaging with in a discussion uh on on how the laws of misclassification should evolve it's yeah. something that hasn't really evolved i mean in in 100 years and 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 markets has gone through many industrial revolutions that that and this hasn't changed that much. I mean, the rule to case law has changed a little bit, but not that much. I think what's really fascinating is that also for worker classification is that it's usually a legal issue that's not very much litigated. Why is that? Because a lot of people don't know that they're misclassified. A lot of uh, companies don't even know that they misclassify workers, right? They just think, oh, you know, I'm just going to hire that person as a contractor because, you know, they they want to they they want to be they have their own company. But that doesn't really the or because the contract says so. I mean, the law is a little bit smarter than that. It, it doesn't look at the contract. It looks at the nature of the of the relationship. So what I'm hoping for is that the, such tools will disseminate the knowledge and help companies to really understand a little bit better the risks. So now for, I'm very excited about this new product because we've been with one of our uh, deals perspective clients that has more than 30,000 employees with a combination of another algorithm that reads the contract plus a combination of a questionnaire, we've been able to identify, to assess the risk of misclassification for 30,000 workers at the same time. Wow, so that's, that's pretty important because back in the day, I mean, which, what comp in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, in an old, I mean, even a couple of years ago, no companies can do that. It's too complex. It requires too many, too much resources. So with that kind of, new tools or research we can do that that we can answer this question in a much more efficient way so and it's great for workers and it, it and it's great for also companies because it alleviates the risk tremendously yeah with confidence too which i love yeah, I, I think that's the best part <laughs> yeah you know the, the here in america we have the napeo right the national association of P, uh, professional employer organizations and i think that's something that's lacking for the eor model uh it doesn't have that 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 industry group that's lobbying for them and i think that's something that would be uh would be very helpful and in the absence totally. of that this is where this case law is going to be so helpful for for shaping that i think for more firms and not just for deal but for other companies trying to operate in in these in these locations too so that's right. uh, it's good for the marketplace and i think i think that's what's exciting so tell me tell me a little bit more about uh the lab like who are the members i believe there's a number of universities involved yeah, like how, right. how do you guys staff it and and who runs it like how does that work so um, so it is uh, uh, um it is um so it was established in uh 20 so last year in, in the fall so it has it's, it's almost a year old so there are a few universities involved. There are a few colleagues involved uh, from uh, INSEAD, uh, HCC, uh, obviously in Canada, there's Quint, there's McGill, uh, there's Cornell. So the idea is to put together a team of independent uh, experts. So, so many of them are not working for deals. So I'm, I'm leading, I'm chairing the lab and I'm uh, uh, trying to steer the ship in, in, in a deep <laughs> direction yes. but uh, uh, it's hard to manage academics you know? <laughs> yeah. to go in their own direction but the idea is to uh, um, um, identify for us our role is to identify an interesting industry problem yeah. and provide data to, to, to these colleagues so now we're working with a colleague at Stanford who is interested in, in, in looking at digital nomads just measuring the number of digital nomads if there's maybe a correlation between digital nomad visas and yeah. the, and the rise of digital nomads. So these are important questions, and we very much want to share the data that we, we've gathered, both on regulation, but also uh, labor movement, labor mobility data, just to, and, and again, to steer, to, to, to encourage uh, a, a discussion on, on, on global work. Yeah. Do, do you have like a set of countries that you're looking at first, next, and, you know, and later, or are you kind of, go, how, do you, how do you pick where you start? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So, for example, uh, for worker classification, we looked at uh, the the countries that has the most advanced uh, regulation in that area mm -hmm. because we want to tackle the complex problem first and then go for the easier the 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 easier ones later. But I think also for 
uh, from a more an economic standpoint, an economic research standpoint, I think a lot of um, you know a lot of the research is 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 very much global, uh, uh, driven mostly by where the interesting data is. So so for example, if, uh, a few months ago, I was writing, I was looking at uh, uh, an interesting question, which is the fact that the U.S. is is becoming the hottest labor market for global workers. So I was not looking at the U.S. because it's the U.S. I was just looking at the U.S. because it's a very interesting question that there are so many U.S. workers working for non-American companies. And the more interesting fact was that uh, a lot of the organizations hiring these workers were based in Mexico. So I mm-hmm. thought it was a very interesting par- pattern that has never happened before. So we looked at that issue and I think we are uh, trying to write a, 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 a paper about this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I think as we talked, right, I think there's just going to be there's going to be more of engagement of the gig worker. And you're right, the digital nomad elements, right? There, it seems like there's always uh, new countries popping up that are offering yeah. those. And I, I know I personally, right, my wife and I are even looking at that. I'm I'm, I'm exploring my um, uh, citizenship in Greece by way of my heritage. And we're looking at, you know, potential retirement uh, locations right. at some point. So <laughs> there's a lot of reasons why, you know what I mean? You, you'd go globally. And and look, I was just doing some uh, some work on EOR recently writing uh, and I was reading that Mercer uh, they came out with their global talent trends in 2023 uh, they had 96% of organizations expecting to redesign the HR function to, with more quote, wow. agile resources 60% of executive expected gig workers were going to replace uh, traditional full-time workers substantially in their operating model so th- th- this doesn't show any signs of slowing down I love that there's you know this vehicle uh, out there but also that you're underpinning it with the work to say like look not only is it is it a vehicle, but it's but it's a compliant vehicle, and we've proven it by way of of this case law. So I, I think it's going to be a win win for not just your brand, but also others, you know, in this market. So so Samuel, one thing, uh, we, you know, Julie and I always are talking about the latest tech here. We've had a lot of conversations recently about artificial intelligence and generative AI and large language models. And one of the areas that we know and we see a lot of opportunity is in compliance, right? There's so much going on. It's yeah. moving. It's a moving target constantly. If you're a global payroll practitioner, you've got to really keep your eye on a lot of balls, right? <laughs> a lot of targets. Yeah. Talk to me about what generative AI is doing in your in your walls and how that's going to help you know uh, facilitate what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. Well, that's um, so that's a very important question. It's not yeah. something we're working with uh, my colleagues at Deal yet. It's it's more of a theoretical problem that I'm working with my uh, uh, colleagues yeah. at the computer science department. I'm happy to talk about this. So, generally, AI. My short answer, especially for HR compliance, so using general generative AI, so like the ChatGPT, the Bard, and so on. My short answer would be never use it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's it, it, it hallucinate half of the time. Most of the uh, solutions or answers it provides are unfounded, and and the way it is trained, it, it is, mm. is it is incompatible with with uh, providing decent uh, legal answers le- or even compliance. You know, basic yeah. issues. So so there's a jurisdictional problem, and so on. the other question also is is and I know that's a, a, a internal policies that many law firms have implemented both in Canada and the US and, and most global firms is that every time you, you input a, a question, I mean, it becomes their data. So you don't want to have to ask, you don't want to end up asking legal questions to, to a general AI. So that's where, so my recommendation for now is to fall back on, on predictive AI tools like the one we we're building, but there are many others. There are many, yeah. you know, there are many, you know, Thompson Raiders have created a lot of very interesting tools in many areas. So these tools, like the the the, the drawback is that these tools are very uh, are kind of what we would call linear. They are they are narrow. So they answer one question: Are you a contractor? Are you an employee? But they are very reliable. So if they answer a question, usually it's like very high accuracy, and also it's it's uh, they are it's explainable. So that's quite important. However, I'm not saying generative AI is is a dead cause. In fact, I mean, uh, my lab at the Conflict Analytics Lab at the university, which is one of the main collaborator of the Deal Lab and Deal in general. So we're working on on an open source uh, legal AI for uh, uh, employment, but also for other. And it has already been adopted by 15 universities in North America. 
So beautiful. And, and 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 the idea is that it's 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 not it's a foundational it's not a foundational model. It's a, we call this a fine tuned legal AI. So we basically make sure that it doesn't have any uh, data that it doesn't need to have. Everything is is filtered. And, 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 and it's trained for law. So it doesn't work perfectly yet, but eventually I think many of these tools will be rolled out to the HR industry. I know Deal has its own, uh, we're working on, 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 on our own generative AI internally, but that's more for general AI, general HR questions. So I think my, my, my answer would be just, we have to be a little bit patient to see yeah. uh, reliable tools uh, 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 being rolled out in the next few, maybe few months, maybe a year. It, it, it depends. I mean, the industry is moving fast. Yeah, yeah. So your work at the Deal Lab is more in the predictive AI versus generative at this stage is what you're saying? That, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I think the generative AI, so it's more experimental and it's more theoretical. <laughs> yes, but it's early. Predict as, as my work in predictive AI was in 2015, but eventually when it's going to be ready, we'll probably roll it out to the Deal lab as well. Yeah. Yeah. Generative is very exciting, right? I mean, uh, you know, Julie and I talk about it with our guests a lot. We talk about it uh, in different areas and, but it is nascent, right? It is very young uh, and it's growing up, but it, but it, it offers a lot of great promise. So uh, exciting stuff. So look, when, when can we begin to sort of see the output or the results or the work that's happening at the deal lab? I mean, are you publishing anything? I know you guys have a report you put out, uh, I believe recently you've put one out uh, in spring, but okay. what else, uh, what, what all can we, can we expect to see coming out of it? Yeah, so so in terms of uh, more classic research, so we've got a, a state of um, uh, a paper, more of a legal paper on the state of global work law that came out in the in the winter. Uh, um, we've got a global hiring report uh, coming out every year, um, and we've got a series of papers. So I'm working on uh, with a couple of colleagues on on as I said, digital nomad and immigration, equity compensation. Uh, in fact, I'm also putting together a book on on global work law, trying to identify both the regional challenges and the substantive challenges for, yeah. uh, related to global work law. So, but that's more for the classic, uh, you know, research output. But we also rolling out uh, this misclass this AI system for classification of workers. So by I'd say you know by October November. We will be able to uh, uh, will deploy the global classification algorithm. So that means it will be uh, capable of predicting uh, worker status in 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 about 100 more 120 countries. So wow. and and slowly will make it as explainable as possible. So first, it will be uh, able to provide the case law in 15 countries by by the end of this uh, the fall. And, and as we make progress, we'll make it as accurate, as, as precise as, as possible. But as soon as, um, so for, for deal clients, it's going to be slightly different. Deal client, we're building a system that will automatically, every time they onboard a client, that's pretty exciting. I mean, we found a way to do this. It's actually quite tricky, but it's, 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 a, it's a problem that we might, we, I think we might be able to crack. So every time they will onboard a client, and it, it could be as many as five, uh, five workers, as many as 30,000 workers, uh, the system might be able to read the contract and identify the risk. And then if there's a risk misclassification, we'll send to our, to, our, to our deal lawyers. But in general, these algorithms, this tool will be available to the general public. So anybody can use this global classification algorithm. And eventually, once we're done with that, I'm hoping to tackle all the issues like termination compensation, even termination settlement, I think, or wage theft. There are many issues, like many compliance tech systems that we can build in this space. Yeah, yeah. Offboarding and outplacement seems to be an area that I noticed yeah. becoming more prevalent as well for, from that scope. So, yeah, no, that's great. I mean, it sounds like both the, I mean, obviously the marketplace is going to benefit from this, you know, the, the, uh, I think shaping a point of view around what a a compliant in- engagement looks like at the country level, um, but more importantly, it sounds like your clients are really going to benefit. And I love the. It sounds almost like an auditing of their of their mis- of their classification at the point yeah. of um, at many points of engagement. So I, I really love that. So what uh, what else? What else? What's the future of the Deal Lab? Where where does uh, where do you guys go from here? Um, you continue to do this work. You add more members. Like, what does it look like? What's your What's your yeah, plan? So our next step is we need to add more industry partners. Obviously, more academic partners. That's great as well. But we would love to also work with uh, um, 
industry stakeholders, not necessarily in the HR space, but sure as well, but yeah. who also uh, are looking at these issues, for example, equity compensation stocks or tax. Uh, and I know there are many organizations, I, I hope there are many organizations out there that are looking at these issues. And, and my take on this is we should collaborate and, and yeah. try to, to produce as much knowledge as possible. In, in this area uh, um, in order to to implement reforms that make sense for both workers and employers. And right now, yeah. the thing is that there's nothing, right? There, yes. There's nothing that's going on. And when I say nothing, it's an understatement, really. I mean, I know in, 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 in our space, you know, there's a lot of people who are very much aware of the what what the what are the ins and outs of EOR. But, uh, but in many areas, in many circles, especially in my world, like of employment lawyers and especially employment law academics, it's not, it's not yet a, 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 a topic of, of and, and as you said earlier, I don't think we want to wait for a disaster. Yes. Maybe there's if there is one day, uh, uh, you know, what happened pretty much in the gig economy, right? There are. It, we waited a little bit too late, uh, too much, and then and then what happened is that a lot we ended up making decisions through Supreme Courts, which is not good. I mean, if you end up for a case to make it uh, uh, to come up to the to the to, um, to 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 go all the way up to the Supreme Court, usually it's a last resort, and I think it might be best to engage as as soon as possible on these issues and start implementing reforms that that make sense. So that's yeah. the policy side. But on the tech side, I think the idea, my vision of the Deal Lab is to build uh, a full-fledged compliance system. But not only for misclassification, I think there are so many legal issues. At my lab at the university, we've developed a tool for to assess, you know, harassment claims, to assess, you know, the validity of wage theft claim, uh, wage wage theft, uh, whether a layoff is is legal, where, whether you know there, there's a uh, 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 you a ter- termination compensation is owed. So there are many many tools that are quite important and and many hr professionals or companies don't really have the resources to to consult with the lawyer on these issues yeah that's a great point and the speed of which that those things happen that that's another thing i think that gets overlooked with eor is the speed of acting on your on your plans right the ability to to do that with agility and confidence and know that you're doing it the right way and in a proper uh, compliant vehicle is absolutely peace of mind so i love it and look i i, I kind of you know i say this a lot i talk about uh, I, t- I try to coach uh, vendors to you know rising tides raise all boats right and i think it, you know the responsibility of protecting this model is the responsibility of the entire marketplace so i'd love to see more firms investing in these kind of um, you know, market benefiting. I, I certainly know it benefits deals uh, product and I certainly know it'll, it'll benefit you guys, but I think it also benefits the marketplace. And that's something that, that I love about this concept. So thank you for what you're doing. And, and thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about it. Okay. How can we engage with the deal lab? I know uh, lab.deal.com, but what else, uh, what, how else can we, can we engage there? Um, Samuel? Yeah, yeah that, that's what I mean. For, 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 uh, um, Employers or even workers who mm-hmm. are uh, concerned about uh, HR compliance questions, I mean, we'll be rolling out a lot of the tools, so they're very much welcome to uh, to use uh, uh, this our research and our the, the the technology systems we're building. I'm very much a believer of open open systems, but more generally, also for collaborators, uh, I'm very much keen to to talk to. Other companies uh, in the HR space, but also outside the HR space, who want to collaborate with us, maybe work with our data, also share, uh, uh, you know, their experience and findings on on global work. And this could be related to uh, labor mobility, so immigration, could be tax, could be IP, could be equity compensation, a pensions benefit. I'm very much eager to establish. Uh, almost a, 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 a community around this HR, o- around global work. So if they are interested, they can reach out to me on uh, through LinkedIn, email, or through the deal website. That's very much something. Um, and, and, and I know this is, and this is, uh, as you said, this is an important question for the HR community and workers as well, uh, beyond the, the, the beyond deal, deal's product. Yeah, absolutely, and I and I think it's I think it's going to benefit this marketplace and workers, right? I mean, I, again, I, I call it a uh, human um, opportunity enabler. It really is, and and I want to see more 
opportunity connected uh, to resources. And so this, this is, this is great stuff. And I, and I'll definitely share all of the links to your uh, LinkedIn and your Twitter, Samuel. And again, you can reach, uh, I'll, I'll put the website in here. There's the, uh, the deal lab at uh, lab.deal.com uh, as well as a misclassification assessment tool that is hosted on the, uh, the deal lab that I think, um, you know, folks can certainly try out and check that out. And I'll also give the links to the global hiring report. Uh, that you guys published, but, but Samuel, thank you so much. Any, anything else that you'd like to um, share or promote anywhere you're going to be, you want to, uh, want to have anyone call attention to now's well, the chance. You're, you're, you're very welcome. Thank you so much uh, for, for having us, uh, for having me on this, on this podcast. It was a very, uh, very interesting conversation. Now as for my la- last thought, I mean, we are, uh, I'm going to be at the international bar association in November uh, uh, I'm organizing a panel on global work with um, representatives of the French government, the European Court of Human Rights. So if there are any employment lawyers that are going to be in Paris, I'd be happy to, to connect there. I think that's probably the biggest, uh, that's probably the, 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 an interesting opportunity for all of us to, to connect. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very good stuff. Julie, where, where are you going to be next? What's, uh, what's going on in your world? Yeah, I am uh, gearing up to be in Las Vegas as awesome. September 13th and 14th primarily um, for the Shared Services and Outsourcing Week. So super excited about that. Yeah. Um, and still uh, still trekking through a lot of client uh, transformations, which is my sweet spot and uh, and kind of my my passion um, in this industry. And I just thank you so much, Sam. The, the conversation was fascinating, and I know I'll be excited to – kind of watch as we were as you guys were talking I was thinking about you know which countries or how are you choosing and prioritizing countries and so I can't wait to you know watch and see how that unfolds and I also was struck by the fact that you know um, you're super credentialed and it's such an interesting thought for me as we promote the HR and payroll professions to think about how folks that have an inclination toward legal and compliance um, but specifically from the legal um, perspective, might actually find that the HR space is incredibly challenging and robust and dynamic. And um, I'm so glad you fell into it um, and and have picked that up <laughs> and taken the ball and run because because hmm. uh, it's just another way to get into this crazy mess of a of an industry, right? That we, that we all right, find yeah. ourselves in. So like, Samuel, please, yeah. There's a little bit of a there's a little bit of an inside joke there. We we have we often ask people when they come on the show. I love to ask, how did you get into the space and how why do you stay? Uh, mostly, it's practitioners and executives and that sort of thing that are that are functioning, you know, day to day. Maybe not on the fringe of like law. Um, and you'd be surprised at how many people will say, uh, "I needed a job, so." <laughs> and they ended up they ended up in HR, which is kind of kind of negative. But then you're like, well, it's great that they actually make their way here. So uh, you found your way to HR, and we're we're thankful for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but that's a very interesting space. I mean, I mean, it is it's yeah. funny how employment lawyers and HR professionals don't really talk that much, and but at the same time, not realize. I mean, maybe what I'm going to say is going to make a lot of employment lawyers unhappy. I find the HR space much more dynamic than, yeah. than the legal space. So I find, I think I'm going to stay. The, yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. And, you know, I have to say, even as a practitioner, organizationally, especially in mid-sized organizations, I find that uh, I've worked with many organizations whose head of HR is also responsible for the legal organization. And so I see organizationally at some of the top le- levels, um, a combination and an acknowledgement there that there's so much happening in employment law that um, that there's you know that there is a bridge that's not too far. So fun. fun yeah, yeah, it is, and this is important work. I mean, I, I, we we need these tools, right? I mean, uh, it, it's like the the hero we didn't know we needed for for global employment was EOR. You know, who knew? So it's it's fantastic to see that oh, we're yeah. progressing that. So. <laughs> How about you, Pete? Where are you going to be next? Uh, everywhere. Uh, I think the biggest thing I, I want to point to is National Payroll Week is next week, Julie. I don't know if you know that or not. The, it's going to be the 5th through the 9th, I think it is, Tuesday uh-huh. to the uh, – which is fitting, right? Labor Day, Labor Week. Uh, so National Payroll Week, thank you to all the uh, payroll practitioners around the world that keep us all paid. Uh, and obviously, it's a recognition for the U.S., but uh, I would say payroll practitioners everywhere. There's going to be so much going on. Um, I'm doing some special things, so stay so stay close to my channels. I can't share what that is yet, 
Um, and then, of course, we're heading out on the road as well. Uh, I'll be at every probably major te tech event this fall season, ADP, ISOLV, Ceridian, SAP, HR Tech, Money 2020, uh, you name it. So uh, really looking forward to that. And I will be also, I just found out I'll be at Workday Rising in the U.S. and Europe. So very, very excited for that. So thank you, Workday. And thank you again, Sam, for coming on. I, I really appreciate this. This You're is great. I, I'd thank love to. Back. I'd love to bring you back at some point and talk about this in I'd the future, to. about what's uh, what's going on. So thank you, thank you so Absolutely. much. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, everyone, take care, and we'll be we'll be back soon.